Hello everyone. So today we'll be taking up the daily quiz for the date 3 March 2024. Before getting into the daily quiz, a small announcement. So regarding the prelims test series, all the details regarding the prelims test series for the current batch is given in the present in the, in the description below. So kindly go through it. So now let us get into the daily quiz. So today the topics have been from various uh, different subjects and the first important topic is from science and technology. So regarding the nuclear technology. So in today's newspaper, today's Hindu newspaper, this was the news that is India seized a dual use equipment from a naval that is from a, from a ship which was going from China to Pakistan and Indian authorities captured this equipment that is dual use nuclear equipment. So now the question is what is this dual use nuclear equipment? Which of the following best defines the concept of dual use nuclear technology? So again the technology that has both military and civil application is it is it the technology that has both civil and military application or is it a kind of nuclear technology that is used for peaceful for purpose or is it a nuclear technology that can be used for space exploration as well as energy production or is it a nuclear technology that can be used in for the application of medical research and diagnostics. So which one do you think is the answer? So as per, as per, the, as per the answer, A is the right, right option. So what is this dual use nuclear technology? Again, see nuclear technology, if a nuclear technology that can be used for your civilian purpose as well as your military purpose, we call such technology as a dual use nuclear technology. Is it your simple concept? If a, new te if a nuclear technology can be used for both civilian purpose as well as your military purpose, those technologies are called as your dual use nuclear technology. The classic example is this nuclear reactor we would have seen these kind of nuclear reactor and what is the main purpose of this nuclear reactor say for example in India we have nuclear reactor in multiple place for example say Kalpakam in in your Tamil Nadu so we have nuclear reactor and this nuclear reactor is is used for generation of electricity so that's a civilian purpose but however in nuclear reactor there's a commodity called as plutonium that that comes that's that's a but that's a byproduct of nuclear reactor again you Using nuclear reactor technology we get plutonium and this plutonium is used in nuclear weapons so the nuclear technology can be used for generation of electricity that is civilian purpose the same nuclear technology can be used for the generation of plutonium that can be used for military purpose those kind of nuclear technology are called as dual use nuclear technology is it clear simple concept dual use nuclear technology any nuclear technology that can be used for both your civilian purpose as well as your military purpose that is called as your dual use nuclear technology is it clear fine so now we'll go to the next question and next question is a combination of both international relation as well as internal security topic so what is this consider the following statement regarding the free movement regime agreement between India and Myanmar. So this is India and this is Myanmar. So in 2018, we had this free movement regime between, uh, it's, an, it's an agreement, it's a bilateral agreement between your India and Myanmar. So let us go in detail. So the free movement regime allowed the residents within 16 kilometers of India-Myanmar border to travel freely up to up to two weeks with a special permit or a special pass. Is it right, wrong, what do you think? it is right so because so as per as per as per this agreement that is a free movement regime agreement so this 16 kilometer zone so this is the 16 kilometer zone between india and myanmar in this 16 kilometer zone people from indian side can go to the myanmar side and people from myanmar side can go to the indian side that was the agreement that was it was a bilateral agreement between india and myanmar in 2018 so this statement is absolutely right so now we'll go to the next statement established it was established in 2018 as a part of india's activist policy aimed at strengthening the ties with southeast asian nations what do you think is it right wrong was was this free movement regime is it a part of your activist asia policy also no, activist activist policy 
yes this is right so the answer is c now we'll go a bit in detail regarding this free movement regime again so the concept is very simple under free movement regime the border zone between your india and myanmar that is the 16 kilometer zone so in this 16 kilometer zone people from india side can go to myanmar and people from myanmar side can come to india that is the simple concept of free movement regime and then we have something called as actist policy so actist policy is a upgradation is a, is a, is a upgraded version of your look east policy earlier we had look east policy it was upgraded into actist policy what is the crux of this actist policy the simple crux or the, the core of actist policy is to in, is to increase the economic activities between india and southeast asia and increase the cultural connections between india and southeast asia and we all know that myanmar is a part of your southeast asian region this myanmar is a part of southeast asian region under actist policy the aim is to integrate indian economy with the southeast asian economy or say increase the economic activity at the same time increase the cultural connection between india and southeast asia that was your actist policy so in order to increase the connection between india and myanmar free movement regime was floated in 2018 so that the connection between india and myanmar gets increased but however, this in this free movement regime, what was happening? So in this zone, the, the people could easily move. So this was misused by various entities in order to illegally smuggle the uh, drugs or illegally smuggle the weapons. And this was creating a major issues in the northeast and it was causing major instability. So in order to reduce this instability, recently the union government, that is Ministry of Home Affairs, scrapped this free movement regime, that is stopped this free movement regime. So Ministry of Home Affairs stopped this free movement regime. So this agreement is now cancelled. But however, recently what happened in today's newspaper, so it was, it was told that, that is the government of Mizoram and the government of Nagaland has passed a resolution, that is the, their assembly has passed a resolution against the orders of union government. But however, we know that union government orders will prevail at the international, uh, in the international agreement. So even now, today as of date, this free movement regime is scrapped. So it, it, it is not in, 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 in functioning. So now we'll go to the next question and which is which is too much in use every day you see about this topic that is MSP minimum support price too much in use because of the farmer protest around Delhi. So again so let us take the first statement consider the following statement the MSP that is your minimum support price is the minimum price at which the government guarantees to buy the crop from the farmer by the by the crops from the farmers is it true what do you think is it is it, it is is it the right statement msp is the minimum support at which the government guarantees to buy the crops from the farmers this is absolutely true or so this is the exact crux of the msp concept in all what is msp minimum support price it is a price at which the government will procure from the farmers that the, the government will procure the agri products or say the farm yields from the farmers that price is called as msp it is not that the uh, farmers have to compulsory sell it to the government if the farmer gets a better price he or she can sell it to some other third party but however the farmer can also sell their agricultural produce to the farmers of, to the government at msp so that's the concept of msp so statement one is absolutely right now statement two the msp is announced by the government before sowing season to incentivize the farmer to grow certain crops what do you think when when is msp announced by the government is it like after during the harvest or before the sowing before sowing of any crop msp is always announced before the sowing of the crop because it will inform it will it will it will enable the farmer to take an informed decision if the msp for any crop say for example say for paddy or wheat or any other crop is high the farmer can select that crop and start cultivating that so msp is always announced before the sowing of any crop so statement 2 also stands right and what about statement 3? So what is statement 3? The implementation of MSME aims to promote 
the aims to aims to provide a safety net to the farmers and ensure that they receive a remunerative price for the crop so what do you think again this is again the crux that is the implementation why msp is needed msp is needed because it acts as a safety net if there is a crisis if there's a crash in the market price what would happen farmers will be forced to sell their produce at a cheap at a very very cheap price that is it will indulge in distress sale in order to avoid distress sale we have a concept of this msp so rather than selling the agricultural produce at a cheap price in the market a farmers can sell their agricultural produce to the government at msp so msp is not at a very bottom low uh, price so it is it is it is a price which which accounts the various which various various inputs that are that are used by the farmers and the, uh, it reduces re adequate remuneration so as a reason msp will avoid distress sale to the farmers so even statement 3 is absolutely right so what is the answer then the answer is d so good now we'll take up the most interesting question which everyone would be fascinated to learn about this concept commissionerate system as well as your magistrate system so it was in news that is your up government has announced the commissionerate moving a transition towards commissionerate system not in entire up in in few few cities like say lucknow so now the enter question is on commissioner aid system i think you would be aware about the administration structure in india in india the administration can either be commissioner aid system or it can be your uh, magistrate system there are two different systems or say two different structures through which your administration functions say for example in up bihar mp in these regions in these states the administration functions on the basis of magistrate system or say in your in your in your say tamil nadu or say karnataka etc so here the administration works on the basis of commissioner aid system so now the question is on commissioner aid system so consider the following statement regarding the commissioner aid system in administration sp that is superintendent of police reports to dm is it true in a commissioner aid system does sp report to the district magistrate no this happens in a magistrate system not in a commissioner aid system in a commissioner aid system your police will not report to the dc your police will report directly to the state government your police will not report to your dc so this is absolutely wrong this doesn't work this happens in a magistrate system not in a commissioner aid system and again here sp focuses on investigation and investigation law and order and dm holds magistrate magisterial power again this is again a provision of your magistrate system not your commissioner aid system again so both the statements are wrong both are a part of your magistrate system not commissioner aid system so the answer has to be d all good now we'll further go in detail regarding what is your commissioner aid system and what is your magistrate system in india so if you see here commissioner aid system so what is commissioner aid system commissioner aid system is where the head of the where head is always the commissioner of police in commissioner aid system the head is always the commissioner of police whereas in a magistrate system the head will be sp in, in a police in a police setup the head head of the police of a district would be sp but however this sp has to report to the dm so in a commissioner aid system assume that this is a district in a commissioner aid system the cp would be the head that is the commissioner of police would be the head in that district but whereas in a magistrate system we will have sp so we will have sp over here but this sp will be the head of the police of that district but however this sp has to report to the district magistrate so this this is the setup in a magistrate system again here the powers so the in a commissioner aid system the entire powers will be with the commissioner of the police so in terms of say investigation preventive arrest or say licensing all these powers will be with the commissioner of the police but whereas in a magistrate system the powers of investigation law and order everything will be the with the sp 
So SP will have law and order powers, uh, investigation powers. But however, the magistral powers will be with the DM. So the magistral powers will be with the DM in the magistrate system. And again, in accountability, the commissionerate in a commissionerate system, see, in a commissionerate system, this would be your state government. So both will go parallelly. That is your, this is your police, this is your administration. Again here, in police, that is your CP, CP commissioner of police will directly report to the state government and again your administration that is your district commissioner will directly report to the state government that is your police will not report to the district collector and district collector will not report to the state government so again in a commissionerate system accountability is directly to the state government not to the district collector or district magistrate but whereas in a magistrate system so this is your state government so your SP is accountable to the district magistrate and district magistrate is accountable to the state government. So this is your magistrate system. So this is your magistrate system and control over police. Again in control over police for a commissionerate system, the commissioner is the head or the commissioner is the boss for entire, entire police system in a commissionerate system. Whereas in a magistrate system, SP is the head. SP is the head of a police system, police police force in a district but however this SP should report to the DM of that district. That is SP will manage all the police in, in his or her district but this SP should report to the DM. Their ultimate boss would be DM. So this is your magistrate system. I hope this is clear. Now we'll take up the last question of the day. So that is your PYQ previous year question 2023. So again, uh, one of uh, this question is from your polity. So consider the following statement in respect to the Constitution Day. Statement one: The Constitution Day is celebrated on 26 November every year to promote constitutional values among the citizens. Is it true? So what do you think? It is absolutely true. So on 26 November, that is the Constituent Assembly, Indian Constituent Assembly adopted the Constitution. But it came into force. When did it come into force? 26 January. But when was it adopted? It was adopted on 26th November. So as a reason, on 26th November every year, we celebrate Constitution Day. So this statement is absolutely right. So what about the second statement? On 26th November 1949, the Constituent Assembly of India set up a drafting committee under the chairmanship of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar to prepare a draft constitution of India. Is it true? No. On 26th November, it was not a, a new committee was formed. On 26th November, the entire constitution was adopted so it was it was it was accepted but when did it come into uh, when when did it come into ex, uh, place so it was it, it came into place in 26th november but it was adopted on say it was it was adopted on january 26th so this statement is wrong so answer has to be so if statement 2 is wrong again answer has to be c so on 26th November, the constitution was adopted. So on all the constituent members signed the agreement, signed, signed, adopted the constitution, constitution. The draft committee was not set up on 26th November. So again, the statement C is right. So statement two is wrong. Answer C is right. So now we'll go into the fact of the day, the most interesting, interesting report and we can we can call this as a mother of all the reports in economic reports in India. Household expen household consumption expenditure survey 2022-2023. Again, this is the most important report that helps in the economic policy that 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 helps in the formulation of economic policy. So this household consumption expenditure survey, this is given by or say so this is rolled out by the Ministry of Statistics Program Implementation that is Ministry of MOSPI. Okay, the, we call it as MOSPI or say Ministry of Statistics Program Implementation. And again, this report is usually published once in five years. The last report was actually published in 2011-12. For the, for the year 2011-12, it was published. And again, the next report was supposed to be published on 2017-18. All the data was collected for this, for in order to publish this report, who collects the data? NSSO collects the data. And the data was 
collected but however in 2017-18 that data was not published by the government of India. So the last available report that is household consumption expenditure survey report is for 2011-12. So this was the last available report. Now after 11 years a new report has come that is household consumption expenditure survey. So this is the new report. So what are the major findings in this report? It's, 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 the, the report has some, some uh, good, good news that is the average monthly per capita consumption expenditure there is a monthly per capita consumption expenditure for both rural area and urban area has doubled. It shows that the economic activity in India has increased in the last 11 years. That is it has almost doubled. If the consumption has doubled, it, it means that my earning capacity has also doubled. So the average monthly per capita consumption expenditure has doubled, has doubled that more, more than doubled in the last 11 years. So if you consider here in rural areas, so in the last report it was 1430 and now it is 3733 3, 3, 3. again here you need not memorize the data you just need to know that the consumption expenditure both in rural area as well as in urban area it has doubled with respect to the previous report the previous report was in 11-12 that is 2011-12 so with respect to that it has doubled so again here so this is the major finding in this report is it clear Again, if, if you get get uh, hold of the summary, uh, go through the summary, but however, you need not memorize the f data over here. Just know the broad trends of this household consumption expenditure survey. The most important data that, that has come out in this survey is that the consumption expenditure both in terms of rural area and your urban area has doubled. So this is the major, major outcome of this report. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.